What's going on? You're watching The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. It's Brian Banks. His new movie's out. What's up, brother? It is a pleasure to meet Likewise, you. Likewise, man. Thanks, man. This is a big day for you. It's a big day. Big day for a lot of people. Big day for a lot of people. Too, yeah. yeah. And it's one of those days where I'm sure, like, if you were to go back years and years ago, you never probably could have imagined this would happen. Never, <laughs> never. I remember being in that crazy, you know, situation where I used to sit in a cell and just think, man, I just want to have a normal life. Mm. I just want a normal life. I just I want to get out of here. I just want to get out. I yeah. just want this to be over. And my entire life has been nothing but normal. Just the contrast from a prison cell and a wrongful conviction to now having a movie be yeah. made about the whole ordeal itself. It's just, it's pretty surreal. Definitely. So yeah. let's wind it all the way back. I want to talk about you as a football player because yeah. you're a big dude. Like yeah. you, you were built for this. So how old were you when you realized like, I'm pretty good at ball right, yeah. right now? So you know, I started off running track. Then I got into basketball because mm. I had these growth spurts really early as a kid. So everybody thought I was going to be like 16. Oh, wow. So you were like the tall middle schooler? Yeah, tall yeah. middle schooler. And so I, I played basketball predominantly for a while. And it wasn't until, uh, I mean, I did a year of Pop Warner football, mm. but it wasn't until my freshman year uh, in high school that a coach looked at me and said, you'd be great on the field mm. if you wanted to come and play. And I tried out, and then after that, it was, you know, the rest was done from there. I knew that that was the sport wow. that I wanted to play. So you were really late into it. I didn't realize yeah. that. So you go from freshman year to, like, being a junior and, like, USC's right up, calling and everything like yeah, that? Yeah, right after my freshman year, I got picked up to varsity, and I played varsity my sophomore year. Wow. And then right after my sophomore year, I got my first recruitment. That's crazy. USC. Wow. Yeah. And there were some other guys in the mix, too, that ended up playing the league, oh, right? Yeah, you guys had a squad. Yeah. We got some heavy who, hitters, Who were the man. guys? Deshaun Jackson was so, yeah, in there? Deshaun Jackson went to Long Beach Poly, Juju Smith, which mm -hmm. is some years after right. me. But the year before me was Mercedes Lewis. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Winston Justice, yep. Emmanuel Wright, um, uh, Darnell Bing, Herschel Dennis. <sighs> Yeah, it was a powerhouse, man. I mean, Deshaun Jackson in the league with the, the deep down, I yeah. can only imagine in high school what he was looking he like. Was, he was a beast. He was, I think, uh, two years under us, but we knew as his, in his you freshman knew he was year be a guy. that he was going to be great. Wow. Yeah. So life is going pretty well for you, and then one day everything changes for you. Yeah. So take me back to, you know, that, that summer day and Winetta yeah. Gibson. What do, you, what do you still remember about everything? Man, it's, uh, it's, uh. It still lives with me. It's not, you know, sure it's, it's it like it was just a few days ago. You know, I was uh, on my way to USC on a full scholarship. I had one more year left in high school. This was my senior year, my biggest year for me. And um, it was a summer going into my senior year. I was in summer school and I left class to make a phone call. And that phone call took me to another side of uh, uh, the school where I ran into a, a schoolmate of mine that I've known for a few years. Uh, we engaged in small talk. That small talk led us to a known makehouse spot on our campus. We made out, we kissed, we touched. That was the extent of it, but at the end of that day, I was arrested uh, and accused of kidnapping and rape. And by the time that they figured out it didn't happen, 10 years of my life had passed. And that was a really emotional part of the movie, too. Yeah. So what was it like reliving that aspect of it? Tough, tough. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not easy, you know, even though it's a film, even though the film is titled Brian Banks, it's still the experience. It's still something that I live and that my family live. And just to watch it all over again, you know, um, you know, certain scenes and, and certain experiences, it, it just kind of resurfaces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know how important it is to tell a story. Um, I know how, you know, that there are so many other people that have experienced this that are currently experiencing it. And so they share that same pain. Some of them are still living within that pain. And so I, I know the importance of why I, I need to make this film, not just for my story, but for other people. So it's one thing to go to prison. It's another thing to go when you haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. And it, it's five years of your life. So when you think about your worst days in prison, what did those look like for you? <sighs> loneliness, man. A lot of loneliness. Um, a lot of trying to figure out and, and understand why this happened to you. Um, and then just dealing with the elements of incarceration from the violence to uh, uh, the humiliation and... and, and, and uh, just just knowing that this wasn't supposed to be you, like this life was not supposed to be yours. And just trying to get through every single day, stay, stay alive, stay sane, uh, can, you know, finding ways to, to love yourself and mm -hmm. not believe the hype and what people accuse you of and label you as. Every single moment, every single second uh, is a fight. So you were on the set for the whole thing here and I was told you couldn't watch the prison scenes because they're yeah. just too much for you. Yeah, there's certain scenes in the film that I just, you know, I. I I just don't care to, to really pay too much attention or to. Just relive, I, or just relive, I can understand yeah, that. Yeah, doors that have been closed that I've, you know, in some ways been able to move from it. Uh, but it just shows how powerful this film is, that uh, if, if, if I, the person who lived it, uh, you know, 
have trouble mm -hmm. actually engaging in certain parts of the film, uh, it means that Tom Shadyac did his job in telling the story. Definitely. And speaking yeah. of Tom, I mean, he had had this whole comedy career, yeah. and then he has some stuff happen in his life where it gets serious. Yeah. So how did he come into your life, and why was he the right guy for this? Yeah, Tom is a legend, man. Yeah. And, and he's one of those guys that you, you know, you don't, you don't expect to meet. You know what I mean? He, I grew up watching his movies, you know. So um, when I got the call that he was going to direct his film, I was a little, you know, taken back. I I'm sure you were. Believe it was him. <laughs> then I started looking into everything that he actually did, and you're right. Everything was was family comedy, and so you know there was a question of I wonder how he's gonna how he's gonna portray this story, and uh, it wasn't until I met him face to face and I had a chance to sit with him, and listen to his mind and listen to his heart and the way he spoke, and to feel and hear his wisdom, uh, and the things that he has experienced that brought him to where he is today. Uh, he was he was more than more than fit for this. Yeah. So how long ago did you guys meet up? Oh uh, man, this was uh, I want to say 2014. Or wow, 15. so it's like five years in the well, making. This film has been in the making since 2012. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember hearing rumblings about it. Yep. It was, it just, was in it the works. Kinda, yeah. It got a little delayed. We were trying to figure out the, you know the best fit for different people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, getting financing yeah. and all the different type of stuff that goes into film. You know, it's not a it's not an overnight thing. No. It takes some time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the things the film really nailed was your life after prison because mm. you're on parole, you're a sex offender, you're, you're not free. Right. You, you can't get a job. You can't do anything. So what was most difficult about that part of your life? Uh, just being naive and to thinking that once I got out, things would be better. Mm. In a lot of ways, it was worse. You know, when you're in you're in prison, uh, you, you know, you don't see the world pass you by and. And you're in you're in you're in an environment where other people are dealing with their own problems and 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 uh, and, and whatnot. And once you're on the streets and you know you, you're the only one in your environment with a skeleton in your closet of that magnitude, uh, to be a registered sex offender, to have to wear a GPS on my ankle for five years, to be labeled and 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 viewed as a monster and a predator, and, and to be called those such names, um, it's a lot to take in for one human being and to still. Uh, be resilient and try to have those things bounce off you uh, as you focus on your truth. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's it, it's a, it's it's uh, it's it's portrayed very well in the film, but there's so much to it. You know, obviously mm -hmm. a 90-minute film can't capture everything, um, but I think that what was what was captured and what was retold. It really hits the message home and people get the idea. Yeah, because I'm sure there's so much more that we, we could talk about for yeah, hours there, yeah. but you, you can't get everything in right, there. Right, you know? right. So thinking about your life, you're able to you know, try and figure things out, and you never gave up on your story. Yeah. You were so resilient, and CIP was huge in all this, oh, yeah. but, but there was a time where CIP was like, I don't know if we can yeah. do anything here. Yeah. So how did you just handle all that? Man, patience. Yeah. Patience and just... Uh, you know, focusing on the things that I could control and not really trying to pay too much mind uh, to the things that I couldn't. Um, you know, I reached out to them the first time when I was incarcerated, and the only way that they could help me was if the witness in my case recanted their story. The only witness was the person who made up the accusation. Right. I reached out to them again once I had made my way home, same thing. And it wasn't until uh, I had the, the right evidence, this recantation tape, um, that they finally saw the, the seriousness and they saw the proof. and. Uh, they saw the the, the key mm. to set me free, and they, they helped me take it the rest of the way. I mean, I can't be I can't believe you pulled off the the whole recantation thing because yeah. getting that on film must yeah. have not have been easy. And there, yeah. there's some scary parts to that too, Absolutely. opening up those wounds again. So, what do you remember about that whole yeah. situation? Uh, playing chess and not checkers. Mm. You know, taking this 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 situation and opportunity opportunity very seriously. Uh, the only way to get my freedom back was to actually meet back up with the person who took it away from me. Uh, and so it was tough. It was tough to, to hold back those emotions, to you know, to not be enraged and to share that rage with that person in that moment. Um, just keeping in mind the importance of, 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 of why uh, this person needs to tell the truth and how it could change the course of my life. You know, there was a lot of thought process going into it before making that decision to meet with, with her. Mm -hmm. Knowing that it was it was a potential violation of my of my yeah. parole that I could be sent back to prison for it, um, you know it could have been a setup. It could have been a number of different mm -hmm. things, you know. And, and but, you know, when when you uh, 
when your life is, is based on uh, just securing your freedom and truth, you, you do anything you have to do to, to, to get that. Totally. And that door was kind of cracked open, too, because she had contacted you, mm -hmm. which yeah. was such, such a strange thing to yeah. think about. I mean, yeah. I can only imagine how you dealt with that whole deal yeah. as well. Um, you know, my mentor would always say, as, as, as we allow things into our minds, uh, as easy as we allow things into our minds, uh, allow them to easily leave. Mm. And that was something that I had to, to keep in mind was that, um, you know, here's an opportunity uh, to get my life back, but, uh, you know, I also have to allow those feelings and those emotions and, you know, all the, the, the negative thoughts that begin to resurface once she made contact with me via Facebook. Um, you know, it took a lot of, a lot of patience, yeah. a lot of reserve. Have you heard from her? At no, all, the last few no, years? No, not since not then. Since not then. since then. Yeah, I think yeah. to finally close the chapter on that must have been a relief. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was a relief that, you know, that that it was finally over, that I was able to walk into a courtroom May 24th, 2012, mm. to sit in front of a courthouse, to sit in front of a judge, to hear the DA uh, say that they concede to the matter, that they agree that this, this prosecution should have never taken place, my conviction should have never taken place. Um, and then to hear the judge agree with that as well and dismiss it and finally set me free. Um, a whirlwind of emotions, man. Mm. Um, happy, excited, uh, weight lifted off my shoulders. Yeah. But then there's also that piece of just that bittersweet moment of, you know, you, you start to reflect on why, why it had to happen, why me. Why this uh, many why years? Why this many years, why it took so long for people to finally be able to, to take it into their heart to listen and, you know. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a mixed emotion, but overall, you just gotta be thankful that it's all over. Definitely. Yeah. So when you were finally free and exonerated, what were parts of life that you got to enjoy for the first time and, <laughs> and what felt like forever to yeah, you? What are yeah, just little yeah. things? <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's funny you say that, because really what, what was so valuable to me were the little things. You know, it's not until you're taken away from everything that you realize what you truly mm -hmm. have. Just being able to open your door and close it without mm -hmm. someone locking it for you and telling you when and when and when you can't come in and out. Uh, to be able to open up that refrigerator just to look in and see what foods in there yeah, and close yeah, it. Yeah. You know, to be able to sit on the steps and look into the sky at night and you know outside your house and just enjoy some quiet time and some some fresh free air. Just little stuff. You know, being with my family, being mm -hmm. able to be a part of celebrations and holidays and birthdays and all the things that I missed for six uh, consecutive years, man. Uh, you know, it, it, it was uh, it was good to be free. Yeah, not having a parole officer on your butt all the time. Yeah. Not, not having, having to, to register. Yeah, not having to register, not having to worry about places that you yeah. are, school parks, anything yeah. like that. Like, those are big things, but I like how you say the little things. Like, those yeah. are things you kind of lose track of along the way. Mm -hmm. you, you, you really don't uh, realize the value of a hug yeah. until you haven't received one for right. years. You yeah. Know? So it's like just that. that and we need that physical touch every day, you more know? Than, more than we think. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So the other part of this is the fo football component, yeah. and so you were getting some calls after that, and then the Atlanta Falcons thing was yeah, just incredible. Yeah, when yeah. when I say that to you, what still sticks out about playing that preseason game? Brotherhood, mm. brotherhood, man, camaraderie, just the uh, the way the team came together, man, to just show support, show love, to be in my corner. Um, I walked in as a as a 28 year old rookie, but I was treated as if I was a veteran on the team. Mm. You know, it was a lot of respect. Um, and, and I just really uh, appreciated what Atlanta uh, and, you know, and the Falcons did for me and, and the love that they gave me and the, the way that they welcomed me in and just to be able to run out there on the, on the field with the guys and um, the crowd cheering mm. and you know, the flames in the air from the, the tunnel and everything, man, it was just, uh, you know, it was dreams restored. Mm. You know, it was something that was taken away and finally I was in that position where you know, I went and got it back myself. Yeah, you know. it's interesting how life works because in alternate timelines, you go to USC, you know, mm -hmm. you win a national championship there, you're playing a league, you're doing your thing, yeah. but here you are with your story and you're making an impact in a way probably you wouldn't have Absolutely. maybe with football. Yeah. Is that something you think about? Uh, yes, I do. I, I, am, I am very much aware of the impact that I, um, you know, am, am leaving on people and, and I'm very much aware of what this film uh, will do for so many other people in similar situations, uh, people that have experienced, uh, you know, difficulties with the flawed system, uh, this just judicial system, um, and the work that goes into to, to making these uh, wrongs right and rectifying the the, the 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 flaws within the system. Like I, 
I I'm aware that I'm now a part of that. I've been yeah. a part of it, but now I think that we have this this really big tool, you know, this uh, lesson, this life lesson that's been, you know, uh, transformed into a film um, so that people can learn about the, uh, the many stories of other people um, while, you know, being entertained. You know, I, I know the criminal justice system isn't, you know, entertaining, it's not appealing, it's right. not sexy, but it is very, very important. Um, and I think that people are, will understand that and see why when they watch this film. Yeah, this will help people get informed for Absolutely. sure. And, and Aldous Hodge really oh, nails yeah. it. I yeah, mean, yeah. Y you've said it before, but what was most special about seeing him play you? Uh, just to see him become me. He, yeah, he, he really did. He I really mean. did, yeah. He didn't want to act out the role. He said, mm. I want to become you. I mm. want to be you. I want to experience your experience. And I mean, he went all the way up it to, to the point of wearing that GPS on his ankle yeah. the entire time that we shot wow. the film. Uh, even when we weren't filming, wow! You know, he went to bed in it and woke up in it. And we went to, you know, uh, Grizzly games at, mm. in Memphis, and he was courtside with this thing <laughs> on his ankle. And I'm like, I'm feeling for him, yeah. you know, knowing just what that felt like. Uh, he took it so seriously. Um, all the cast did. Mm. They all understood the value and the importance of the story. And uh, you know, I, I I definitely think this is this was this will be the film that will uh, show people uh, just how powerful. Um, Aldous is as an actor, as a human being, as mm. a person. You know, not only is he, uh, you know, not only did he star in this film, but he also has become uh, a member of this fight mm. uh, for for saving lives, man, for people that are you know behind bars. Yeah, no yeah. question. And then Morgan Freeman pops in oh, there too. Man. I was yeah. like, wait a yeah. minute, <laughs> I didn't yeah. expect this. God himself. Yeah, <laughs> and he plays an impactful role in here yeah. as well. He does. He plays my mentor, John yeah. Johnson. Um, he's a teacher at the juvenile hall when I was you know first incarcerated. Um, a person who helps me rediscover and, and to, uh, to, he helps me, you know, um, discover who I was and what I was capable of, my strengths, and, and to deal with the weaknesses and how to make those stronger. Mm -hmm. and, you know, he was just one of those guys who um, believed in me from the beginning and saw something in me that I couldn't even see in myself at the time. And, uh, you know, to this day, he's still my mentor. We still stay in touch. He actually came to the big premiere. Oh, wow. And uh, received a standing ovation. So, I mean, I just... I'm happy that his story can be told. You know, he was, he's he was uh, he's retired now, but he was in the the juvenile hall uh, uh, complex in the industry for over 30 years teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, the same things that he was teaching me and and helping me understand. He was he's, he was doing it years before me, and just to have somebody like him that designated his life towards helping youth and trying to stop that crossover rate from going from juvenile hall mm -hmm. to prison. I mean, a man deserves his own film, mm. you know, honestly. Yeah, big yeah. time impact. Yeah. And then I want to talk about your mom because th that's your rock right yeah, there. Yeah, so. make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> when you think about everything that your mom endured with you, what specifically comes to mind with that relationship? Strongest woman I ever met, strongest woman I'll ever know, honestly. Um, what she sacrificed, what she gave up, what she put into this, um, and to, to be defeated you know, and to see her do everything that she can and, and everything just didn't work, you know. And still then she didn't give up. She, you know, drove hours mm. every other weekend to come and visit, wrote letters all the time, you know, except to collect calls and, you know, th how that runs up the bill. Absolutely, yeah. Um, was all, you know, always made sure I had food and things that I needed while incarcerated, all the while still dealing with home and bills and responsibilities and work and my younger brother, my older sister. And, you know, the fact that we had lost our stepfather mm. you know, two years before I was incarcerated, it just was a lot for her. And still, she, she didn't break, she held strong, she, she kept, you know, taking care of her family. I, I, she's just an amazing woman, she mm. really is, and she won't take credit for yeah, it. Yeah. She'll, just, she'll just tell you, like, I was just being a mom, just doing what I thought I needed to do. But That's I'm a like, whole different You went level. above and beyond, yeah. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So what's life like for you now? You know, what fills uh, up your days? Yeah, fills up my day as my six-month-old boy. Oh, like, congrats. Little, yeah, That's you. awesome. Got a little boy at home. If I'm not working and on the road, then I'm with him. Mm. I'm spending time with him, and he's already, you know, moving quick. He's on his knees and crawling mm. already at six months. He's, you know, he's pulling himself up and standing against the couch. He's got dad's strength. I mean, yeah, man, on. he's saying mama <laughs> and baba. Is like, so he's just, like, pretty advanced right now. He's 98 percentile in height. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, I can go on and on about him, you know, <laughs> but as you can see, that's where I, where I am every day. But uh, aside from that, you know, I'm still advocating for, for those in, in need. I'm, I'm on the advisory board of the California Innocence mm -hmm. Project. Same with the National Registry of Exonerations. I wrote my book well, titled yeah. What Set Me Free. It's in stores now. Everything that you couldn't see in a 90-minute film and 
all the questions of how you survived it, what kept you happy, why mm -hmm. aren't you mad and angry, it's, you know, it's in there. I got gotcha. you. But pretty much just stand in that lane, stand in my lane of uh, this was my experience, this is what I went through, and now I'm going to pay it forward and help those in need. So when people check out the movie this weekend, what is the big takeaway in terms of just your life or yeah. just something maybe they don't see in the movie that they can just take home with yeah. them? Yeah, uh, you'll see in the film, I didn't give up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that we can't allow one moment in time to dictate the duration of our life. That regardless of where we are, regardless of where we are physically, the most important thing is where we are mentally and spiritually, that we understand ourselves and that we're aware of ourselves and that we are empowered, you know, self-empowered um, to love ourselves regardless of what's going on, what people say of you, about you, against you, um, know your truth. Um, also, th we, have to, we have to make awareness and, and expose this flawed judicial system, mm. that these are instances that can no longer be swept under the rug and, and, and uh, to be treated as if they're not happening. What I went through and what I experienced is, un is unacceptable mm. across the board. Yeah. You know? and, and that goes to the same for every person who has been wrongfully accused or convicted of something that they didn't do. And I'm talking about of various amounts of crimes, not just the, the same one that I went through, but to be accused and convicted of any type of crime, to be put in prison for something that you did not do, to be treated like an animal in a cage for something that you did not do, across the board is unacceptable. And so we have to make a change. And if, and if our system, uh, our judicial system won't rectify it itself, then we have to make some noise and, and kind of put the pressure on them to do so. Amen to all yeah. that. Yeah. Brian, oh, absolute yeah. pleasure. Thank you, brother. Appreciate Thanks so much. Man. Brian Banks, the movie, out today. Check out this weekend. That's Brian. I'm DJ. We'll see you next time here on Please. The Sit Down.